<laughs> um, all right, so now it's time for our main guest speaker, Ashley Brailsford from our Joyful Learning Community. Um, Ashley, PhD, is a longtime educator and nature enthusiast who launched our Joyful Learning Community to help nature-connected organizations transform their programs to be more culturally relevant and inclusive by honoring culture, exploring well-being, and inspiring joy. Her teaching and research interests are grounded in family engagement and building trust in culturally, racially, and linguistically diverse communities. Her presentation today will discuss strategies and tools for creating culturally relevant nature education programs that honor culture, explore well being, and inspire joy. All right, take it away, Ashley. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for having me today. And I want to thank uh, Elaine Boyd for. Uh, talking to me about TWIG a few um, some months back in the spring, and um, uh, that has really opened my eyes to the many ways in which we're engaged in um, the work um, throughout TV. So thank you for that, Elaine. So um, I am excited to talk to you today about um, creating culturally relevant nature-based programs, and this has become a um, topic I'm pretty passionate about because often I hear from organizations and people in various kinds of nature connected organizations, how do we engage more um, culturally and racially diverse people in the outdoors. And typically I push back on that question and I say, what institutional barriers or historical um, aspects have contributed to the disconnect? for uh, historically excluded communities in the outdoors. And so until we address that question first, we're not gonna get to the other piece of uh, engaging more culturally and racially diverse people in the outdoors. And so we gotta look at it as an institutional uh, challenge uh, and look at the barriers within our organizations and not look at the people and ask why, why they aren't coming. And there's a lot of historical reasons for that. So uh, I wanna acknowledge that first, but as, we get into um, our topic today. I always like to start with uh, what is one thing that has brought you joy this week? So we always start on a, on a high note um, as we get into things. One thing that's brought you joy this week. Uh, and I think for me, what's brought me joy is that uh, I'm starting to reconnect with families that uh, we were doing some programming with um, so that we can begin our fall programming. So that what's bringing me joy this week. So um, some folks are yoga. So your son, Ashley, is turning one. That's exciting. Um, oh, yes, blackberries. I got a whole little container of blackberries from um, a farmer who dropped some off to us um, last weekend. They were great. Awesome. Walks at Shelby Bottoms, puppies and peaches. Awesome. So as those continue to roll in, I will get started um, by first acknowledging that we're on the ancestral lands here in Nashville area of the Cherokee East and the Shawnee. And again, um, just to encourage folks to check out the Native American Indian Association of Tennessee and support their efforts to um, bring awareness to the various tribal nations that have contributed to Tennessee's history and stewardship of the land. A little bit about me, um, as I'm talking, you can also share, it, especially for new people who might be on here and not know each other, uh, what organization you might be with in your role. I don't know, you all may have already done that, but uh, it's kind of nice for me to see who's in the room as well. But uh, my background is as an educator. And so I started out as an elementary teacher in Nashville Public Schools, first through third grade, uh, and then uh, went into higher education. I was a professor in early childhood education. And um, that took me to Indiana University, and I was out at the University of Nebraska Omaha doing some really cool work in early childhood, and then at the College of Charleston in South Carolina. And my work has always been grounded in predominantly Black and Latinx communities, and uh, particularly around family and family engagement. Uh, and my last role was with a nonprofit out of Louisville, Kentucky. I was a director of uh, program development across the country of family literacy programs. So I love books and I love children's books and I love sharing um, about 
uh, different types of multicultural literature with families as well. I'm also an outdoor enthusiast. And so um, ever since I was young, I was a longtime Girl Scout. Um, my father lived for a couple of years out in Ogden, Utah. And so we did a lot of exploring in national parks out there growing up. Uh, and then um, my latest, I guess you say, stint in relationship with the outdoors has been a lot that I've learned over the years through Outdoor Afro, which is a national nonprofit uh, that seeks to reconnect Black people and inspire leadership um, amongst Black people in the outdoors. And so you can check them out and look at the wonderful work that they're doing. But that experience of being an outdoor leader here in the Nashville area gave me the opportunity to really explore our local metro parks and learn a lot uh, about what they have to offer. And so we did things like kayaking. We also um, very intentionally connected the history of uh, the spaces that we were in and some kind of lesser known places um, to some of our events. So for example, uh, we did an event out at Fort Negley um, connecting the history there of African Americans to the outdoors uh, and an unwanted camping, I should say. Uh, so if you haven't visited there, you should. And uh, a place called Promised Land over in King Kingston Springs uh, has some beautiful history there too um, that you should look into. But these, with that opportunity to be an outdoor Afro leader for a few years brought me was this realization that for many of us, the connection and reconnecting to the outdoors was through stories and being able to see our history and ourselves through those stories. And so um, I'll come back to how that connects with the work that I do in just a moment. I'm also a homeschool mom. So when the pandemic hit, like most people you know, who have children, uh, your kids were at home and you you were schooling. Well, I, my son was in kindergarten at the time. And um, I just really cringed at the fact that he wasn't getting a lot of outdoor play. Um, he was in a metro school. And so, and I knew going into it that that was probably going to be the case. But it when the pandemic hit, it gave me an opportunity to um, explore and be outside more with him and just to really see the joy and the learning that was happening for him just, just by being outdoors really inspired me to um, pursue my own business and uh, create something that was also gonna bring me joy. And for that, for me, that was connecting all of these pieces of uh, doing work with families, uh, doing work in the outdoors or uh, connected to nature, telling stories, and also, um, you know, uplifting joy and uplifting our, our stories in the outdoors. So, um, that's a little bit about me. And um, I always begin with some community agreements. And of course, uh, as you've been doing, taking care of your needs throughout the presentation as you see fit, um, share your knowledge. You know, there'll be some opportunities to share um, and questions that we might have or that I might pose, but also being open to what you hear as well. And then listen for one thing you would like to try or to apply to your own practice uh, as we um, go back um, to our, our day jobs. So um, one of the first questions I always like to ask people is to really think about when you hear the word nature, what image comes to mind for you? And you can put this in the chat. When you hear the word nature, what image comes to mind for you? What does the space look like? What people do you see? Uh, what activities, if any, do you picture? So what does that image bring to mind for you? Walk in the woods with friends and family. Thank you, Karen. Forest with lots of sunlight, trees, flowers, and hopefully not seeing people like that. Trees and waterfalls. Yeah, greenery, open space. All right. Um, Places with a lot of fish, a walking trail. Awesome. Okay, so I want you to keep those images in mind. Okay, we're going to come back to it in just a moment. Um, so 
The next question I have for you is, what is a happy memory you have of being outside and why? And I'll share with you my happy memory as you think about that and type in the chat. This is a picture of my uh, grandparents there on the right, my grandmother, my grandfather. This picture was probably taken in the late 70s. Uh, but this is a picture uh, at their farm in rural North Carolina. I grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina. And so my grandparents were a couple of hours away, uh, about 20 minutes outside of, of Fayetteville. And uh, it's still a very rural area. And um, what I remember and what's a happy memory for me, my parents uh, would always send my sister and I down to Godwin to uh, stay with my grandparents for a week or two in the summer. And we thought it was so much torture. We were like, there's no TV, there's no cable. <laughs> you know, what are we gonna do the whole time? But you, you start to figure out how to entertain yourself. And one of the things that I loved about the farm, of course they grew everything they ate, um, but there was a plum tree out in the front. And I remember my sister and I would go out there and just pick off fresh plums and eat, eat, eat. And I can remember my grandma saying, get off my plum tree, you're gonna get sick, right? From eating all the plums. But that's a very happy memory for me because I think this picture represents like this place of simplicity and calm. This was them and what they did after church on Sundays was, you know, to talk and fellowship with family and friends. And, and that was their way of, of enjoying nature and being outside. So, um, so yeah, some happy memories. Let's see. Uh, camping on the Cumberland. I see some people um, saying that. For some people, it's being in the river, camping with family. As those come in, um, one of the things I want to share is that in different groups, when I ask the question of nature uh, versus the happy memory, there's usually a couple of um, images that surface that are a little different and for us to think about um, for some communities. And first, when I said nature, many of you all said trees or um, you know, walking or in some place very remote, right? Uh, and then sometimes when I ask the question in um, certain communities, what is a happy memory of being outside? Often it's, it involves a family member and it usually involves or can involve a very simple activity of being that's close to your house, okay? So um, what I challenge people to really think about is that of course we hear that phrase, nature is all around us, but often when we're doing programming, um, sometimes we view nature as being very far away from us and or going to some remote places when that's not always accessible for everyone. And that's not always how people enjoy nature. So it might be sitting on the porch. It might be sitting under the tree at your home. It might be watching birds outside your window. All of those things count as nature, but the, the way in which we frame nature, the way in which we talk about nature in the outdoors, we have to be very mindful of. Uh, and so um, sometimes we have to shift our mindset about um, what counts as nature and how people like to engage with nature to really engage people in different types of programs that are relevant to them. So it may not be what you want them to do. It may be more things that may look like some of these things, taking a walk with your family, having a picnic at the local park, um, like I said, it might be just around your own house, listening at birds, um, skateboarding, whatever that might be. So uh, that's one of the things that I found to be really important is to, um, to really think about what uh, nature looks like in urban spaces, as well as um, all kinds of communities. So what is joyful learning? Um, when I started the business, one of the things that I wanted to bring um, forth and really uphold again was uh, joy. And so um, I decided that nature-based experiences to me um, that honor culture, explore well-being and inspire joy uh, is what joyful learning is. And so really this came about as I looked at 
uh, nature programs for my son and got into looking at nature-based education, which wasn't my background. Again, early childhood education broadly, that usually happens in childcare centers as well as in um, school systems was, was what I was most familiar with. Uh, but these nature-based programs, I started getting interested in, in that. And what I really saw was that uh, a lot of times, often uh, nature was presented in the absence of a cultural and historical context. Those stories weren't present. It was talking about plants for the sake of talking about plants or animals for the sake of talking about animals. Um, or even, you know, environmental uh, education and sustainability, which is, um, yes, a piece of it, but then for us to see ourselves or for certain communities to see a part of why those things are important, uh, uplifting the stories of people who look like us and, and in spaces um, is what helps to, to feel connected. So centering the past and present stories and roles of historically excluded people in nature is a part of the work that I do as well. So what does this work look like, right? What, what do I mean by joyful learning? So uh, what we're gonna do is um, today share a little bit about joyful learning in action, but I'll talk about transformative programs. So programs that um, don't just seek to tell information for the sake of telling information, but to provide context. Uh, I call those transformative programs. Um, and then uh, at the end, um, I'll talk a little bit about some of those strategies for creating culturally relevant programs. So transforming programs. So I always like to start with uh, an example, a very concrete example. So this is a book um, called Farming While Black. And uh, it was written by Leah Pinneman, who's a co-founder for Soul Fire Farm. If you haven't seen or heard of their work, you should really look into it. They're out of Albany, um, the Albany area in New York, doing some really um, groundbreaking revolutionary work uh, to reclaim um, agricultural practices amongst Black and Brown communities. Uh, and so um, transforming programs um, essentially means that how Leah approached the work for Soul Fire Farm was to uh, reclaim and talk about the work in a way that was relevant to um, people's backgrounds um, that they could identify with, um, that uplifted the stories of, of goodness um, throughout history. It didn't focus on, you know, the hardships of, you know, us when we worked the land and, and slavery, but it focused on stories that showed even pre um, coming to the Americas that uh, we had all this knowledge in agriculture and the practices and that's why we were enslaved, right? And so uh, that it wasn't just, you know, uh, bringing people for the sake of bringing people, but there was a reason. And that reason was that there was a huge level of intelligence, right? And so um, starting there, but then also even throughout the, the really difficult um, history of slavery, as well as um, during the civil rights movement, showing examples of people like Fanny, Fannie Lou Hamer and um, George Washington Carver and Booker T. Washington's work and how they were examples of, uh, of revolutionaries in many ways um, in connection to farming um, helped to uh, reframe, I think for African-Americans, how we think about uh, farming and not just for African-Americans, for everyone, right? Because that's important uh, information. So this book um, not only shares how to grow, but it talks about the ancestral practices and how um, uh, that connects to how we grow food um, for ourselves and how we, we keep healthy bodies, but also um, it shows, you know, the science of, of plants and all of those things, but then within the context of how did George Washington's contributions contribute, um, or I should say his um, scientific work contribute to the agriculture field. And that's not necessarily something we're taught in a master gardener class. I went through Tennessee's master gardener class years ago, uh, and it's for, and I'm sure some of you all have too. And so you're taught how to grow for the sake of growing. There's not much cultural context uh, within that course. And, and many of the other um, things that we go through, uh, programs that we go through, it's the same way. And so um, this just offers a example of what it means to ground 
uh, curriculum and to ground programmings in cultural and, and um, historical context, while also uplifting good examples and not just the hard hardships over time. And so that's what I mean by transforming programs, it's transforming how we talk about uh, uh, the work, whether you're talking about environmental education, whether you're talking about foraging, whatever those programs might be within your institution. So one of the frameworks I like to share with people that's often helpful for thinking about your programming, because you're probably like, I don't even know where to start, what do I do? Well, this is a, a really cool um, framing that is helpful for most people to think about their programming and, and what they're doing. And so uh, Dr. James Banks is a, a renowned educator in our uh, field, multicultural education. And back in the late seventies, he started working on this idea of, of uh, multicultural curriculum. And so uh, one of the frameworks he's developed is this approach to multicultural curriculum that for many people is helpful. And so what he talks about is, you know, most of us, when we attempt to uh, talk about different cultures in our programming, it's the contributions approach, right? It's a still uh, very uh, white centered approach. Um, and every now and then we may insert people who uh, add some cultural elements to it. Uh, and so it focuses on the heroes and holidays. So that means the only time we talk about people of different backgrounds might be when it's MLK or when it's um, uh, Hispanic heritage much, that type of thing. And so um, that's the contributions approach. And so then the additive approach is like the next level up where content concepts, themes and perspectives are added to curriculum without really changing the structure. So you may say, okay, we're going to still have this very same curriculum like we usually have in schools, uh, but okay, we'll add more, you know, books to it that share different narratives. So this week we'll read The Color Purple, next week we'll, you know, uh, next month we'll add another book um, uh, or have a guest speaker, right? So you still haven't really changed the structure of the curriculum, but you may be adding to it uh, and what you're doing. And so the way that relates to our nature programming uh, or nature connected organization, same thing. If you're talking about um, some of the concepts around, I don't know, water conservation, uh, you still may present it as it's always been presented and then say, oh, there's this, you know, one local person who can, who can share um, their knowledge or, or a book that may have been written by a person of color that you might add to what's already there. The transformative approach is more so what Leah Pinneman did in her book was to uh, center the work of um, uh, historically excluded communities in this case and and what she was writing about was black farmers right and so the structure of the curriculum has changed to enable students to view concepts events and themes from the perspectives of diverse ethnic and cultural groups uh, and so it's totally reframed right from from a different perspective and the social action approach is uh, saying uh, the next level up, it's not enough just to transform your programming, but then our job uh, is also to think about how are we taking what we've just learned and addressing um, uh, injustices that might be in our community through the curriculum. So for example, one of the things that um, Leah also does a really good job of in that book is to say, uh, yes, here are the agricultural practices, but here are some other actionable steps you can take to reclaim farmland that's been um, taken away from black farmers over the years. Here are some steps you can take to redirect funding to black farmers who have no longer been able to um, and or have never been able to uh, obtain that funding. So really thinking about if you're talking about environmental justice work, um, you're not just talking about the problems in the environment, then you're also talking about what are actionable steps. Uh, and it might be in a project approach that um, uh, the individuals in your uh, program can take to support um, environmental justice efforts. So uh, I just wanted to share that framing um, for you, for you to take a look and really think about the programming that you might already currently be doing. Where does it fall? And if you are, which most people are, and I was too, uh, and at different times, you'll, you'll fall back into that contributions approach or additive approach, because that's how we've been taught. Uh, but how and do you put yourself to continuously try and make sure your programming is 
um, more in that transformative space that you're centering the narratives and the work of um, diverse people in um, nature and the outdoors, okay? So uh, what are some examples, okay? So here's some concrete examples that I have um, implemented in my own um, programming that I want to share with you and that I've done with children. And what you can think about is, you know, how might this apply to your own context and your role and what you're doing, whether it's directly with families or whether you're working with your staff uh, and in uh, what um, particular area of focus you might be working in. So whether you are the Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency, whether you are a naturalist program, whether you are um, in sustainability work um, in terms of recycling and things like that. So um, really think about that. But um, I'll just share some examples here. So I started off with those trivia questions that um, uplifted some people you may not know because the goal here is to say that all of us have people in our communities who have these roles that are important to nature and in the environment that we may be overlooking and often overlook. We usually go to the same people uh, to ask for information or to invite to our programming, uh, but there are so many other people who contribute to our environment and to nature in different ways. Um, and so one of these people is uh, Miss Cynthia. She owns Henna City Farms out in Pegram, Tennessee. And so right on the outskirts of Nashville. And so um, I met her just last summer. I live in Brooklyn Heights Community Garden now, but I was volunteering here. And um, during a market day, she came and um, she was good friends with Miss Pearl, who I'll talk about in a moment. And so we started talking, she's like, yeah, I raise chickens. I have like almost 200 breeds. And so she's like, and I work to um, conserve heritage breeds. So here's this woman that we wouldn't really think of as a birder, right? Uh, and that's new vocabulary for me too in the past few years, a birder. Um, but she has all this knowledge about how to conserve certain breeds, how to, um, um, what certain um, breeds are unique to um, our African hit. Uh, ancestry. She was just telling me the other day that um, she was recruited by the UT Extension recently to do some research on conserving a new um, breed from Africa. And so uh, she, her background is a nurse and she's been engaged in research over the years in many ways. But here's this opportunity to engage with an individual who's very much connected to nature and uh, she's a poultry farmer. And so uh, we brought some families and kids out to her farm and uh, she um, talked about um, their needs, how to care for chickens and all of those things. And so I always start off um, our time together with families reading books because I think, of course, I love literacy and I love children's books and there's so many lessons we all can learn from children's books. Um, but I started with preaching to the chickens. And so um, it also provided an opportunity to talk about, you know, history in terms of John Lewis and his contributions uh, to Nashville. But um, it also tied into um, the idea that, um, you know, chickens are good listeners too. And so it, that's how he got his start um, in becoming a preacher. He would often um, preach to the chickens that were on the farm that he grew up on. So um, that's just one example of uh, an event I did last November with families. Another one I did was, what is a community garden? And so um, at uh, the Brooklyn Heights Community Garden, we came out and we talked about the importance of community gardens and um, composting and uh, I started off reading the book Growing Table, which uh, is about Will Allen, who is a urban farmer out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He was a former basketball player uh, many years ago in Belgium. And so um, he started this farm, Growing Power, to, of course, address, address um, not having fresh food in, in the community that he was in. And it became a really powerful um, Place that address food justice um, challenges. But um, the children came out and, and uh, we took a tour of the garden and Miss Pearl, that's Miss Pearl there. If you haven't met her, she is a light. <laughs> and so uh, you should come out on Wednesdays. We do some volunteer um, work here in the mornings and the evenings, uh, but look them up as well. And um, 
um, that just gave us an opportunity to show and uplift again another individual in our community who is connected to nature in ways that we may not always think about. Um, this was an event we did in uh, January. So I do enjoy the other things like hiking and kayaking, all of those things. Uh, and so we went um, hiking at Longhorn State Park, um, just on the trail. And I didn't um, seek to engage a park ranger because again, I really want to uplift kind of everyday people who we may not be looking at who are, who are engaged in the outdoors in different ways. And so, um, Shabazz, he's an attorney by day, um, and uh, but an avid, avid hiker. He grew up in East Tennessee, and so um, he often takes um, young um, uh, youth or youth, I should say, out into the outdoors. He camps when it's snowing, <laughs> which is crazy to me, uh, but he often hammock camps, and so uh, he brought some hammocks, or he had his... Um, future son-in-law, I believe, to, to take his place as he actually got called into court that day. Uh, but um, he came out and, and provided um, hammocks for the kids to play around and they climbed trees. And so we also just talked about what an outdoor guide does. And so it's also exposing kids to the different roles um, that are uh, available to them in the outdoors. And so that was a fun one as well. Um, the other thing I try to do is to expand our uh, ideas about what it means to engage with nature. So everybody's nature, as I said earlier, isn't um, a hike. Everybody's nature isn't a kayaking event, right? And for some of us are, um, uh, you know, it might just be exploring some of the spaces just within a very um, center of the city. And so I really enjoy art. And so um, I wanted to do something around um, art in public spaces. And so this is a mural that's at Frankie Pierce Park, which is downtown, um, like a couple of blocks from the farmer's market. If you haven't been there, it's a really great little park for kids. And there's a little dog park there too, uh, that was built in the past couple of years by Metro Parks. And so um, I had Ola who painted the mural there of uh, Frankie Pierce. Frankie Pierce was a very prominent figure in the women's suffrage movement here in Nashville. And uh, we talked about her role and we talked about uh, what murals are and their importance to our public spaces. And so then he engaged the kids in um, also um, a painting activity that was really fun. He put paint in balloons and had the kids draw on some plywood, um, you know, their drawings, they could draw anything, right? So some of them were drawing buildings, they were drawing cats and dogs, but then they would take the balloons and they were filled with paint and they were throwing them at it. And this is like the mural they um, created uh, for themselves. And so it was really, really, uh, a fun um, opportunity to um, engage, I think, in the outdoors and, and in nature in ways we don't always think about. Uh, so that was um, the mural artist work. Um, the other work we did or event we did was, what is an angler? And I'll admit, this was a new vocabulary for me just in the past two years. I, we always just said, we going fishing. I don't know what an angler is. That wasn't vocabulary we used. And so, um, this, uh, we went out to, uh, what park is that? In Madison, I'm going blank, but uh, there's a pond there, it's a Metro Park. And um, David with the Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency, he comes out, he brings all the equipment, uh, the fishing equipment, but it was really important to me that there was a, a, a woman and a woman of color who was leading this event because often we don't think about women as, as anglers, right? And so um, I asked around and it was actually, I think it was um, um, Khaki at the Maddox Fund who told me about uh, Angela Foster. She's like, I've heard of this woman, she fly fishes. And, um, and so look her up and see if you can find her. And, and so I did a Google search and found Angela Foster and I just called her uh, and she has a, 
a business where she'll take people out fly fishing, but this woman has fished all over the world and she'll teach you how to fly fish um, as well. She's just got an incredible story too. Uh, but uh, she was more than willing and happy to come out and talk about how she got into fly fishing in the past, I think 20 years. She grew up fishing with her parents uh, with a um, um, just a regular, uh, what do you call it? I guess a, a pole rod. Yeah. A pole rod like my dad did. Um, and so, um, she, she just shared with the kids and they thought that was really cool to see her fly fish. So it just provides again, another opportunity to see what's available in the outdoors. And I post these pictures of these books here because sometimes I can't find books that are, uh, related to the topic that show um, children and families from different backgrounds. So the literature must be high quality literature. That's a big thing. Not all books featuring um, children or people of color are high quality. And I try to make sure they're written by um, people of color because that makes a difference. Um, so I, I put these pictures of these books here because uh, when I lived in Omaha, we had a, it was a huge refugee population there and often uh, they would make their own books in the programs, English programs they were in in the school district. And so uh, I encourage people when you can't find your uh, a book, then you can make your own books. And even if you're not, you know, a program where you're like, oh, we don't read to kids, you know, we don't need to do that. It's still a really fun way to create your own books to document the work that you might be doing um, in your program. So uh, it, even I used to make books even with my college students. Um, and that was always fun about some of the things that we were learning. So just wanted to share that. Uh, another thing we did, so instead of doing a monthly event, I wanted to move in the direction of doing series, a series with families. And so in the spring, we did a six week series called Gardening for Food Justice here at the Brooklyn Heights Community Garden. So we had families to come and uh, we went through uh, talking about how to grow food and why we grow food and why certain communities experience food apartheid, not food deserts, but food apartheid calls out um, the systematic racism that uh, is at play and which causes food deserts, right? So we try to emphasize um, the word food apartheid rather than food deserts. And so, um, and then we took the social action approach, right, at the end and said, well, what are some things we can do to um, feed our neighbors and feed ourselves? And so, uh, so we did just so many really enriching things around growing. Uh, we talked about rituals in different cultural groups with growing. So before we actually put a seed in the ground, uh, we went through and talked about rituals um, that some communities practice and, um, and adding that cultural and historical piece to what we're doing. So uh, this last picture, we talked a lot about um, Dr. Carver's work in our uh, um, Gardening for Food Justice series, but this last picture was just a few weeks ago at a program called Brighter Days, Edge Hill Brighter Days. And so I um, was just invited there to share with the kids an activity. And I said, well, why don't we make our own watercolor paints? And so, uh, cause that's what Dr. Carver did. Many of us, I didn't learn until recently that he was an extraordinary painter, landscape painter. So look up some of his work. Uh, he was even, um, I think a, a big time winner in the World Fair at one point for um, some of his works. But um, that's uh, again, uplifting some of the stories about people um, who've made contributions to nature that we don't often hear. And so um, the kids um, had the opportunity to make those watercolor paints and uh, then they painted pictures and things. So that was a lot of fun. Um, so I encourage you to Think about, hopefully you didn't take away from this, like I need to go and reach out to Miss Pearl or I need to go talk to Miss, um, you know, Cynthia or Shabazz and all these things. I mean, that's fine, but hopefully my, my hope is that you look around in your community and start to identify people of various backgrounds who can contribute to your programming in different ways and not just contribute, but also be centered in your programming and that we are paying people. That's the other thing I emphasize. Please don't just invite people and not offer them compensation. Um, too often our knowledge has been taken over years without um, compensation. They have the right to uh, say, no, that's okay, but at least offer that um, because it is important knowledge. Uh, these are some other folks that 
um, we've had for um, not just in-person programming for families. We were doing these joyful hours, uh, which we just did one on Friday with Patrick King at the Urban Green Lab. And he uplifted so much good information about environmental justice in Nashville that I learned so much from him. And I've learned so much from these other individuals here to hear about the bottom is a avid birder and young and um, just so knowledgeable. She's a budding ornithologist that I met out at Mill uh, Ridge Park um, earlier in the year. And um, that's Kenneth Stewart. Uh, he was recently in an AARP article about his work. And, uh, and this is uh, Daylin Gao, who started the Native Women's Wilderness out in Colorado um, to really uplift uh, and reconnect Natives um, women to, to the outdoors. So I challenge you to think about who are the people in your community? Who are your friends, your family? Um, how can you start with yourself in uplifting um, these, these really great stories? So um, moving away from the um, deficit narrative of um, what you know, black and brown communities don't have or, or what they don't do in the outdoors or why they don't like and all these things starting to really show what we are doing, what we do enjoy doing, okay? Uh, so I'll end with um, just saying, you know, some of the strategies you saw uh, was to shift your mindset about what it looks like um, to engage in nature, to build trusting relationships in your community. So you can't just approach people and find someone's like, hey, come do this with my program. Like you've got to develop those relationships over time and it has to be authentic and it has to be genuine. And then, of course, transforming your program. We talked about that by centering um, the stories. So um, there are other strategies that I um, share uh, when I um, do um, workshops for different organizations around creating culturally relevant um, curriculum. And I'm very protective of, of that um, information. And so I, when I do you know, presentations, I just share a few of them, but uh, for workshops, um, that are paid, then I, I, uh, we go through all those strategies. And um, there is an opportunity, uh, I'll share in a minute for, for you to engage if you would like to in um, an upcoming workshop. But um, so often people say, oh my goodness, where do I start with all of this? You can start with something you already like to do outside, um, something you would like to try, something new you would like to try, uh, and, and just building relationship with different organizations that may serve a population you're interested in and asking what you can do for them first rather than what they can do for you. That's the biggest thing. And um, so sometimes I enter into new communities. I don't ask for anything first, right? Like I'm, I came to the garden first, I volunteered my time and it was months before I was like, oh, there might be an opportunity here for both of us, you know, that's mutually beneficial. Uh, I can do a gardening series and then this uplifts more of, you know, information about your your garden in the community. So um, go in without um, asking first. So um, what is one thing you learned today that was helpful um, to you? Um, uh, something new you might have heard you had considered? And then uh, maybe what is something you still have a question about? So I will give you a moment to think about that and um, we'll go from there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ashley. Yes, everyone, please drop your comments, your questions in the chat. We do have a few minutes for, for some questions and reflections, things like that. But I know I learned so much from this today and I'm really, I'm really inspired to just get out there and do a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, John said, loved, write your own book. Yes, me too. Um, that is very cool. Love preaching to the chickens. Yes great books to give for a baby present. I think that's so awesome. Keep those comments coming. Um, definitely want a book list. Ashley, I have a question for you. Yes. So in your work that you have been, I mean, just working with so many interesting people in communities and, and maybe some people that don't get the spotlight so much, what is um, the most surprising thing that you've learned? Mm. Um. What is the most surprising thing you've learned? I, I don't know that I'm surprised, but uh, maybe 
one of the most, um, I guess, fulfilling things I've learned is that uh, people are um, wanting to engage in the outdoors, um, especially um, people of, um, that have been historically excluded. It's just that they need to feel safe and it needs, again, to be relevant. I <laughs> have to go back to that, right? And so uh, this is disrupting this narrative that Black and Brown people don't want to be in the outdoors. I'm like, look at all these people, right, that I've been able to find and talk to. Um, and so, yeah, I just think that um, disrupting that narrative has been a joy to see in action that there's so many people doing this work in different ways that we may not be um, taking a look at. This question comes from Destiny. What has been your greatest challenge in the work you are currently doing? Um, my greatest challenge, I guess, getting um, people in um, um, of the dominant culture, you know, white people, to move away from the idea that um, again, that uh, there's just not interest, right, from our communities, and so. Uh, some will say, well, how do we get more people to come out to our program? I'm like, you're missing the point, right? <laughs> like, the question is, how do we create a safe environment, an inclusive environment, and work on ourselves first so that we feel um, and that we are um, being as welcoming as possible and creating a, a culture of belongingness that may attract other people to come. But really more so, it's not about bringing other people to your program, but how can you uh, again, create a more inclusive space, but also you do the work so that other people that may be in your community are hearing these stories. Because reality is, you know, if you're in a, in a predominantly white community in a rural area or even in an urban area, you may never have more people of color coming into your program. That's just the reality. But what you can do is still bring in those stories and contributions to create a sense of appreciation and respect for everyone's contribution. And that that contributes to the to the global picture, right? To a, a, a bigger and better society when we have an understanding for one another, regardless of where we are and if we're in homogenous communities. That is some incredible advice to, to get all of us, I'm sure, we're all on fire just to do something right now. And I think that's really good um, perspective just to, to keep us really focused on where the work needs to be done instead of where we think it needs to be done. So thank you so yeah. much, Ashley. We greatly appreciate you. And I want to, can I add, um, I mentioned the workshop that's coming up. If anyone is interested, uh, you can um, check out um, Joyful Learning 101. So this is where I go into what all these strategies are. Uh, it'll be August 17th, um, 3.30 to 4.30. You can drop your email um, and I'll add you to the list to receive um, that information. I don't send you crazy <laughs> emails every day and every week. I probably send uh, a monthly or bi-monthly link to um, any upcoming workshops we might be doing or programs even for families that we might be doing and that's it. So if you want that information, or, or just to um, be in touch with me, um, you can put your uh, e email in the chat and I'll save the chat and get that out to you with a follow-up email. And um, you can follow us on um, Instagram just to see what, what work we're doing with families. And you'll see my son, he's seven, um, and uh, some things he might be doing uh, and other people we might be uplifting as well. I like to uplift a lot of different people. And of course, you know, feel free to reach out to me, Ashley, at our Joyful Learning Community. If you have questions or wanting things for your programs, that's what I basically do is a lot of workshops and consulting work um, with organizations. So um, you can find me on LinkedIn. So thank you so much um, for having me. Uh, this has been great. And I look forward to um, continuing the conversation um, with you all. Thank you, Ashley. Yes, we're getting lots of emails in the chat and we're gonna drop all your contact info. We so appreciate you. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Gracelyn who is gonna give us this month's announcements. Awesome, thank you so much, Jocelyn. And thank you, Ashley. That was, like everybody has said, an absolutely phenomenal presentation. I feel like we all learned so much and a lot of things that we can apply to TWIG specifically. And I know I can apply in my workplace. 
um, in my community. So thank you again uh, for coming to talk to us. It, it means the world and um, it was a wonderful presentation. Um, but welcome again to Twig. I know we're, we're running short on time, so if you have to drop off, that's okay. Um, but I will just quickly run through our announcements. Um, we are in August already, which is just crazy, but welcome. We're, uh, we're so happy to have you. Our mission is to empower, inspire, and connect women who are committed to environmental sustainability. So thank you all for helping us achieve that goal this year. Thank you to our sponsors. We could not do what we do without you. Um, we are so thankful for your support. If you or your workplace is interested in becoming a sponsor, we do have information on our website at tennesseewomenandgreen.com forward slash become a sponsor. Um, or you can just go to our website, become a sponsor is under get involved. Thank you for starting or renewing your membership with TWIG. Um, if you are new to TWIG or if this is your very first meeting and you haven't made the jump to become a member yet, please reach out to our board. Um, that's what we're here for. We would love to connect with you over a cup of coffee or a, a virtual cup of coffee um, or tea. And it's, uh, it's great to connect with each other. It's, you know, the point of TWIG is to uh, share these connections and our, and our mutual passion for sustainability in Nashville. So please feel free to reach out and connect. Upcoming events. So on Saturday, August 7th, which is tomorrow at 9 a.m., Cedars of Lebanon State Park has a volunteer day. Um, and the activities may include trail maintenance, park beautification, um, exotic species removal, or exotic invasive species removal, gardening, painting, mulching, pretty much anything under the sun, wherever they need you, uh, but it will definitely be fun. Uh, so I encourage you to get out there. On the same day tomorrow, um, the International Interior Design Association is doing a zero landfill day. So you could actually go to Cedars Lebanon State Park at 9 a.m. and then um, the zero landfill day goes to noon, I believe. So you could just actually do two in one morning. Um, but they are going to be giving away some of their unused uh, home materials. So be sure to check that out. Um, on Sunday, August 8th, that's this weekend, it's coming up. Uh, we have a twig yoga hang at the Flamingo Cocktail Club. If you haven't been, it's one of my favorite places. It's so cool. Um, and we are, uh, we are just so thrilled to do this. This is gonna be a really cool event. I believe we have four spots left. Um, it will be a restorative yoga practice with coffee or a mimosa complimentary afterwards. So be sure to join us if you can. Um, and definitely join us on September 3rd, 7.30 a.m. for our next monthly program. And the yoga hang, I think Renee will probably drop our email in the chat, but uh, just send us an email if you're interested and we can get you all signed up. Uh, it's $20 a person. The Deep Tropics Festival in Nashville will be happening at the Bicentennial Capital Mall State Park. Uh, that will be August 27th and 28th. And they have invited TWIG members to volunteer in exchange for a free general admissions pass to the festival, which is just awesome. Uh, this year, they have the goal to be the most sustainable festival in the United States, which just blows my mind. I'm not surprised. It's a really great festival, but uh, it's a really ambitious and exciting goal. So anyone who is interested in volunteering can email tnwomenandgreen at gmail.com for more in info and we can send you a sign up link. That's gonna be awesome. And our 2020 annual report is now live on our website. Um, this is something we've been working very hard on uh, and I am just so impressed with it. And um, even through a pandemic and all these you know, changes, I feel like Twig has really pulled through and we have you all to thank for that. Um, some highlights include nearly $6,000 awarded through our seed fund program as grants, 761 program attendees, over 22,000 people reached via social media, 23 new and renewing sponsors, 130 new and renewing members, and 27 volunteer hours through our Iris's Book Club. Um, to see the full report, go to our website forward slash annual report. And we do still have t-shirts. Um, if you are interested in purchasing a t-shirt, just email marketing at tennesseewomenandgreen.com um, with the size and color you would like. And we're doing porch pickups right now.
And anyone registered for this meeting can grab a free coffee at Ugly Mugs in East Nashville. Just mention Twig, and that is courtesy of the Green Interchange. Last but not least, thank you again for spending your morning with us. Um, we are just so thankful to have all of you. It's you know, it's the highlight of my month. So uh, thank you all for being here. And I encourage you all to, you know, while we're virtual, you, you can have, you know, guests for free. Um, they can attend as many meetings as they would like virtually. Um, so I would just encourage everybody to bring one or two friends who may be interested. Uh, it's a great way to share the mission and vision of TWIG. Um, but other than that, y'all have a great rest of your month and thank you again for being here.